Bill is not in bend. What would make you think that? <laughs> the fact that I'm in a t-shirt and shorts. <laughs> and there's <laughs> multiple ceiling fans spinning above you. And are those mosquito nets? <laughs> uh, there is a mosquito net on the bed behind. Uh, I was outside, but it's probably going to be too noisy. <clears throat> I'm in Costa Rica. <laughs> Hey, if you see my kid, if you see my kid running around on the streets, tell him hi. He's down there too. Uh, oh, is he? I'm up on the Nicoya Peninsula now. We were down in the jungle on the Osa Peninsula last week, but wow. this is drier. It's supposed to snow here later this week, Bill. I know. Really? I know. Finally, I, it's going to be an interesting landing in Redmond on Sunday. <laughs> be fine. All right, Mickey, are we, uh, are we set for, uh, it looks like we're streaming and recording, so are we good to go now? Okay, perfect. All right, well, welcome everybody to our December Environment and Climate Committee uh, meeting. I'm going to um, start off this meeting, last meeting of the year with the roll call. And I know there's a number of folks um, that might be joining late. So um, just a heads up on that. So once I say your name, um, please unmute yourself and say that you are here. Um, well, I don't see, I take it back. I don't see our names on the current agenda. So I'm gonna open up the last one. Okay, um, starting again, uh, Bill, are you here? Indeed. Hello. Um, Covey? I'm here. Uh, Kelly? Here. Uh, Kersey, I believe, said that she wasn't going to be able to make it today. Uh, Mark? Here. <clears throat> here. Uh, Neil Bonsgard, I'm here. Peter? Here. Rory? Here. Serena? She's running late. Maybe 15. Oh, that's right. Now. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Um, Tess? Yeah, I'm here. And are either of our um, ex officio members here? I don't see them on the list. Okay. Um, um, that's great. Um, so first order of business is to, or I guess second order of business is to approve the um, meeting minutes. Um, is there any discussion or changes um, for the minutes before we, before we vote on those? Wonderful. Um, if does, is anybody willing to make a motion to approve these minutes? I'll make the motion, it's Bill, to approve the minutes. Bill makes the motion, is uh, somebody to second? This is Kelly, I can second. Great, Kelly seconds, and then uh, raise your Zoom hand for voting. I'm voting yay, I just, I'm trying to find my okay. hand right now. <clears throat> No worries, it's hard uh, while presenting too. Um, okay, um, go. don't forget to lower your Zoom hand. Um, okay, and then, so that uh, uh, passes, um, or is there anybody abstaining or voting no? Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna move on to public comment. It looks like we do have some people in, um, some attendees here. So I'll pass it off to Kayla to run public comment. All right, good evening, or good evening. Jeez, sorry guys, my brain apparently wants it to be evening already. Um, we do have one hand raised. I do apologize, um, I'm losing my voice. Um, so if it's difficult to hear me. Um, so our first caller today is Barb R Rumor. Barb, I've given you the ability to unmute yourself. You've got two minutes. 
unmuted. You Am are I... unmuted. It's not working. Can you hear me, Bard? I can. We, we can okay, hear you. We, we can hear you. Okay, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I just would, uh, number one, uh, Barb Rumor, Bend, Oregon, uh, volunteer with Pollinator Pathways Bend. And I just wanted to thank the ECC for all they've done in the past. And I know I have uh, put in requests before as far as, you know, considering B city stuff, which, uh, you know, anyway, you've uh, declined at the moment, but I just wanted to say that I appreciate all that the city of Bend is doing for increasing pollinator gardens. And um, I just want to uh, encourage you to consider the proposal that's on the bike rack today for putting out a uh, general proposition to say absolutely no neonicotinoids in the city of Bend, even though you're not doing it in general, um, this would help the entire city, including homeowners and people outside of government property in general to know that this is uh, a really important issue, especially since the city of Bend and Bend Parks and Rec has done so much to put in so many um, pollinator gardens, uh, having no neonics in the, in the community would uh, help. And there's recent evidence in the last couple of uh, weeks with a new study that says even one for uh, native bees, even one encounter with neonicotinoids decreases their ability to reproduce by a lot. So anyway, uh, thank you for uh, considering the bike rack proposition. That's it. All right, thank you, Barb. Um, Neil, it looks like we have no more callers for the public comment. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we're going to um, jump into the rest of our agenda. Um, and I wanted to give um, a little bit of a priority update. Um, I think that some of the conversation that we had last week or last week, last month, um, it seems like it would be valuable in the future to be able to um, spend a, a small chunk of time updating everybody um, on where we're at with all of our goals. Um, and so I wanted to check in with the group to see if there are any kind of specific components that would be valuable in a, um, in a dashboard. Um, it sounds like somebody is, okay. They're good now. Um, unmuted. Okay, um, so uh, I can give kind of a brief update, but now that we are starting to have some subcommittees um, and there are other presentations and things kind of happening with city staff and other places, um, it's gonna be important, more and more important for us to be on the same page. And that was kind of recognized last, um, or I recognized that last meeting that there um, had been uh, not everybody understood kind of where we were at in some of our um, goals and projects. So um, I guess it's an it's an open question um, for where that if it would be more valuable to have somewhat of a dashboard that we update before the meeting that has those updates in it, or whether it would be worth having um, kind of brief uh, report out every uh, month on the different. Um, kind of projects that the ECC or subgroups are working on. Does anybody have any feedback on dashboard versus um, uh, dashboard updates versus meeting updates in terms of how we best use our time? I see Bill raised his hand and Rory unmuted himself. So. <clears throat> Um, we'll go okay. Bill and then Rory. Okay. I, I mean, I think 
a little of both. I, I think the dashboard makes a lot of sense just because that one's fairly easy and, and you will have the information prior to the meeting. So that's good. So if there are questions, you'll have time to think about them. And maybe we, we're always limited with time. So it seems like maybe the update piece would be maybe not always as needed, perhaps. Uh, if something is there's something significant and they could just contact the chair and say, well, I think we have something to report out. I don't know. Great. Yeah, uh, update's good. That, 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 that's, I really yeah. felt like we, we need, we, there's so much going on. It, and I, it, you, easy to get behind. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Rory? Uh, I'm a fan of the dashboard if we have the resources to do that. Uh, like Bill said, I think it saves time. It also makes us very transparent and lets any member of the public you know, hopefully can access that and, and see exactly what we're working on and what progress we've made, which is great. Yeah, that's great. So we can, um, I was looking back to see um, what we had and we created a dashboard when we first created some timelines for, um, for our goals for the presentation to the um, stewardship subcommittee. Um, and so we have that kind of rough, um, uh, that rough space, but I think that um, you know, if timelines are changing, then we can bring that up to the group. Or if there's a specific, like, you know, a specific action or a specific ask of the committee from one of the subgroups, then that'll be a good opportunity to actually uh, reserve some meeting time for a, a physical update instead of just a kind of, you know, minor minor updates. Meetings were held, no decisions need to happen um, into, instead of spending too much time there. Um, well, if you have any other feedback, um, definitely let me know. Um, but we and we'll have some um, some opportunities to have some of those updates a little bit later in the agenda. Um, so let's move on to the bike rack. Um, Serena is I don't think is here yet. So I'll um, um, I'll open up the bike rack um, to. Um, see if there's any other pieces on here. Um, the one that was added was the uh, neonicanoids, I think I said that right, um, that was brought up um, in public comment recently. Um, and then there is a um, another process that the city's going um, through right now that is part of the ECC goals, um, the um, the EV roadmap that we are kind of going to follow and at some point we'll probably be um, asked to review. Are there other items um, that we need to kind of review from the bike rack or that we want to um, kind of uh, bring up to put into a future meeting? Um, Mark? Yeah, the, the email that uh, Carly Rose from 350 to Sheets sent, uh, she sent me a little bit, I, I talked to her a little bit, she gave me a little more detail. They have been working with the City of Eugene on their rules, which would uh, tie into our bullet on missing actions from the CCAP regarding <clears throat> requirements on electrification for new construction. And they mm -hmm. offered to put together a presentation for the committee and city council members um, regarding the, the data that they're finding, the uh, process that they're going through in Eugene, looking at what the implications are of that requirement. So uh, I, I know we've talked before about uh, bringing in outside experts and that seems like a, a pretty relevant topic uh, for us. So I, I don't know if that needs a full discussion other than sort of collectively decide that um, we were open to their uh, offer and we would coordinate with them to find a time for the presentation that is uh, works best for as many people want to join. Yeah, do you think that that would be a um, uh, Do you think that that would be best as a, a kind of subgroup um, or a smaller group to be able to kind of start to dive into that topic? 
Yeah, yeah maybe. Or I do mean, you think I, it should come to a whole meeting to start? I, I don't think it would need to come to one of our normal meetings. I think it would, it's just an outside presentation that they're offering. I can't remember exactly. They've got a couple of folks, including maybe someone from Lewis and Clark uh, that they'd offered to bring in. So I was trying to get back to that email from Carly. Uh, um, did they mention, maybe they did. I think they've, they've got some people they think are experts on the topic that would be presenting. So feel, I, I think they're probably open to it being more conversational as well, but I think they have a presentation and data that they'd like to, to make. So it feels like you could make it open to a lot, as many people as want to join, but if it end up being a smaller group, that seems fine as well. Yeah, maybe we can have some conversation as a group kind of following that to figure out um, what, what conversation we want to bring to the whole committee um, on the topic of electrification. Yeah, because I, I was thinking in particular, I would want to ask them where they can bring data that show information about what the extra costs are, if any, and what they're seeing as the long-term uh, benefits and costs, who, who is um, sort of bearing the cost potentially, are there, are there implications between developers versus homeowners or uh, property owners and how the city or even eWeb is looking at it. Bill, I know you've got um, experience in this, so maybe you should take over that process or um, question as well. And maybe this is more of a buildings committee topic, I, which I know I'm not a part of. So um, it does feel like useful information, but I realize I might not be the right one to lead that. Yeah. Um, Peter? I think it's related to Mark's point, I was, and I, I believe I forwarded it to you, Neil, I was uh, connected to by a member of the community <clears throat> um, regarding the Stevens Road Tract development project with similar um, uh, concerns or issues or topics as Mark was just discussing. Um, so I'm not sure what the city's role is in that, but it hit my radar a couple of times and I thought it might go to the bike rack and then it might actually tie into what Mark was just discussing. And so um, do you think that the broad conversation is still um, fine to have now or could, do you want, um, I know the specific uh, limitations that we have on specific uh, projects can be, you know, that that's a it's a challenge for us as a committee in that space i just was thinking as if that's going on to the bike rack i just wanted to bring it up so it didn't get forgotten um and okay. then when I heard what mark was saying i thought maybe this actually fits together in that i i know very little about the stevens road track it's just been brought to my attention a couple of times i don't even know if the city has any influence over what's happening there okay covey um, I just had a general um, idea right now regarding the bike rack and how we're structuring it so far. Um, mm -hmm. and I know I've brought this before too, but I feel like we are adding items usually every meeting um, and then it kind of stays there because we're focused on implementing CCAP as our priority, as our, our primary objective. And I was wondering if it would make sense to start anytime someone, you know, if someone, if any of the committee members would like to add some of the bike rack to be like the chief sponsor of that item, and then maybe schedule some time on a regular basis, maybe 15 minutes each meeting where um, one or two of the people can then start discussing their bike ride. Maybe do some research and then share it with the committee and then we can start making progress on some of the items. So that way we don't just have a list of items that just keep getting added to the bike rack that you know we don't really get time to come back to or circle back to. So I was wondering if that would help if, if we had a chief sponsor for each item who would then be tasked with doing more research and coming back and then sharing with the committee. I think that sounds like a, a a good opportunity to keep progress, even um, even if we're not taking you know enough time to to take full action on these things every time. Um, but I think that having that space for those um, to kind of have a rotating cast and um, and an individual diving into these details, I think that's a really good idea. Um, can we follow up on kind of a an idea of what that might look like and bring it to the next meeting? Should I do that? Uh, yeah, the, let, let's 
we we can work with you on that and then bring it back in January. Sure. Okay, great. Bill? And it seems like part of the goal of the, of the bike rack is to have a list of brainstormed ideas for future agenda items. So, I mean, I think mm -hmm. I, I, when I look at this thing, I think a lot of these things eventually are going to have to make their way to the agenda. Right. Of the full meeting. So, so having someone maybe in the background working on them a little bit and getting them closer to being able to be an agenda item might uh, to extend what Kavi was suggesting, but they gotta, I mean, like oh, something like the fuel, the natural gas ordinance, that's, that has to eventually come to a full meeting, I think, because that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. For example. Yeah. Kavi, is your hand still up? And then we're gonna, um, okay. Um, so we are going to be able to hop over um, to the water conservation master plan. I don't think we're, uh, I think we might be back um, a couple of slides. So um, Aubrey and Mike, um, I can hand it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, members of the Environment and Climate Committee. Happy to be back with you again here uh, at our third meeting. Um, I'm joined again. Uh, so my name is Mike Bittner, Utility Director here for the City of Bend. Uh, joined again by uh, City of Bend staffers Patrick Griffiths, our Water Resources Manager, as well as our uh, as, well as, as well as Dan Denning, our Water Conservation Program Manager, and we have Aubrey Koenig with us uh, from Barney and Worth, who's been uh, helping us uh, throughout this entire process capture. Uh, advisory guidance from this committee as we seek to expand the WaterWise program and uh, dive into some more specific code alignment activities here in the future. So um, I am going to kick us off here and just have a quick uh, look ahead at our slides or our, day, our, our hour here today. And then I'll quickly turn it over to uh, Aubrey and Patrick to uh, give us a quick recap, but then we'll uh, dive into some of the uh, information we've heard today. So just as a quick recap, yeah, there we are, uh, December 9th already, uh, time is flying. So we've had some great interactions and some, uh, I think some great conversations with this group so far. October 14th uh, was the uh, water supply and conservation overview, a lot of foundational information there. Um, November 10th, I think we had a little bit more back and forth and some good Q&A with the team, uh, excuse me, with this committee. And then between the, uh, the last meeting and this one, we've uh, supplied the survey uh, link to all the Environment and Climate Committee members and, and received that feedback and have a lot of that here to, to share with you today. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our conversation here today. Um, we'll be talking about some of that high level uh, policy level advice um, that, uh, that this committee wants us to capture. And I know Aubrey's got some, some ideas as far as how to capture that so far. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the next steps ahead uh, that involve the technical working group. Um, and really uh, the next steps ahead as we uh, seek to uh, uh, do more water conservation across the board here, um, City of Bend. So Aubrey, you want to uh, advance our slides? I know Aubrey is uh, driving the slides here today. So Aubrey, you want to kick us off with this slide and then, uh, then I think we're going to turn it over to Patrick. Perfect. So uh, just a quick sense of how that, uh, how today's meeting fits into the bigger picture game plan. Um, so again, taking some time to, to uh, share the highlights from the survey feedback and further discuss those, reflect on them as a group. Um, after today's meeting, uh, our team will go and prepare that summary memo of the feedback that we've collected from you guys through, through both that survey and today's conversation. And then we have a meeting um, next week, next Thursday with a subgroup of the committee to uh, review and finalize that memo. So there's a chance to kind of see the, the end product here um, and for you guys to um, uh, that subgroup, I think there's about four of you who are going to join us next Thursday. Uh, that is the, the policy level advice. All of that document uh, is also going to inform that next step, that future uh, conservation and efficiency technical work group that will be formed in 2022. So that's kind of the, the broad strokes game plan. We'll come back to this at the end of the, the presentation too. But uh, next up is, is Patrick to do a quick recap from meeting two. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, good to see everybody. I really enjoyed reading your comments. I thought you guys were uh, great students. That's the old middle school science teacher in me talking. Uh, you paid, paid attention to the details, had some good interactions with Bill Welch. Um, but let's just jump to the next slide a little bit. Uh, I think that what we've learned is our focus on outdoor water use is uh, clearly 
seen by you guys and understood that's our key focus. That's our bigger opportunity. Again, not letting go of the important amount of indoor conservation and keeping that trend going in the right direction as well. Um, the slide on the right here with the red and the blue, again, just trying to show that the outdoor sector was growing at a faster rate than indoor use. And I think that's just a ratio thing. It's not necessarily the end all be all. There's so many ways to to show data on water production and water use. But again, just showing if we're gonna prioritize scarce resources and programmatic changes, uh, where, where to be. Uh, next slide, Aubrey. The real focus here uh, is, uh, again, our residential customers are the largest users of water in the irrigation season. And that is mainly driven by outdoor use, and predominantly the biggest driver is the size of the yard. And so I think everybody's sort of recognizing that and we have some opportunity also around the waste pieces there. Uh, I did notice there was some confusion around irrigation only meters versus commercial water users. And remember about half to a two thirds of our commercial users are uh, an office building that behaves very much like a single family home and that most of the water is in a year is used outdoors on their landscape. They might only have a coffee pot and a bathroom inside with no commercial type uses of water like for a restaurant or something like that. And then the irrigation only meters, really where we have those are on our right of way meters where it's only irrigating during the irrigation season. We have those in some parks. Remember, not all parks get City of Bend water. Some of them get irrigation district water pumped directly out of rivers. And then uh, the other irrigation only meters are some of those larger irrigated sites at schools that we could peel off a separate meter to better track and manage that water. And we're still looking at policies around that. I'm gonna stop there. Any other questions so far in the last two slides recapping? Okay, next slide. And again, uh, I think it was really encouraging that you uh, understand the three tools that we're talking about here, sort of our existing water regulations program uh, and, and that demand management component of that, as well as just the waste and messaging to the public why you don't want water running down the street, whether it's from a park, a school, uh, a business or a home. And I think that's all the other uh, affiliated benefits of that by not having runoff into the rivers, carrying particulates, things like that. There's a safety component as well as the overall water quality protection by leaving more in stream when you can. Uh, and with that, I think those are the three kind of wrap up slides. I just want to stop and make sure there was no other questions that this committee is still keeping you up at night. Is there anything else you want to talk about or any other questions that are again, nibbling away at you that we could cover in a, in a quick break or do some follow up on? Like Mark, it looks like you? Mark has his hand up. Yeah, ju just a, a quick question on the the mandatory the mandatory or enforcement dimension of these issues. It was a little unclear to me when we would be talking about enforcement of regulations that are already on the books versus coming up with new uh, regulations. So I, I could almost imagine also separating more uh, comprehensive or complete enforcement of existing rules versus establishing new rules. And sort of that, that first one feels like a really strong, obvious uh, opportunity. And then the second, I realize there's a fair amount more fuzziness to think about whether it's good or bad to, and where exactly to target new mandatory requirements. And especially if they have um, strong enforcement behind them. Mark, I think that's an area that we're gonna dig into and in what I'm starting to call the CNE group, the, the Conservation Efficiency Technical Work Group but you're absolutely right. On the Ben Code, even in odd watering days and then watering from nine to five, we already use the technology with our AMI metering to determine who, we, we know what a pulse of irrigation zone firing on a particular irrigation zone looks like. And we can, we can really pull that data out. We know who's watering on the wrong day. We know how many there are. We can, I think we ran a report last week that tells us there's still, if you believe it or not, there's still customers out there running the irrigation zones. And a lot of them are commercials that haven't turned off yet or blown out yet for really lack of uh, somebody being tasked with that follow-up. So you're absolutely right. And I think that the runoff and the, and the waste issues are ones that we have not 
really uh, robust job. We, I don't believe in the 20 years I've been here, we've ever issued a ticket and, and taken somebody to court. Though we have done what we call hanging the door hangers, giving people shook up a little bit, you know, shaking their tree a little bit, as I call it, and just waking them up and handing them the educational material and then helping work with them, not just being, you know, uh, punitive, but really helping them change their ways and then when we have somebody that gets on the list every year, and there's some businesses along some major corridors that have done that, lack of attention, lack of key staff, whatever the reason may be, those are absolutely areas that we'd like to, to get staff on a little bit. And they're actually anxious to go. We need to get a little more council backing and maybe some more discussion with you guys to get the public's buy-in on that. And I think it's there. It's just a matter of developing the ways to do that. Thanks, that's helpful. Yep. No, really good, good catch. Well, with that, I don't see any other hands raised. We can always circle back. You always can feel free to call myself or Mike. Um, questions as you're thinking about this stuff and you wake up in the middle of the night, we're here to help. So just give us a holler. And I'll turn it back to uh, Aubrey at this point. All right. So we're going to uh, dive into the advice that we've heard from you guys so far. And, you know, the first two meetings, you guys heard a lot of information sharing from our team. Today is really about digging into your thoughts, and so we're going to try to do more listening and leave space for that. Um, did want to start, not going to share all of the survey questions. Um, thank you guys so much for responding to that. It's incredibly helpful. Uh, but I did want to start with this kind of baseline question that we asked everyone, which is, you know, in your opinion, how aware do you think community members are currently of the WaterWise program? You've just, you know, just heard a lot about the program. Um, and you guys on a scale of one to five uh, from, you know, not aware to five being very aware, feel like there's a lot of room to grow here. Uh, so this is, I look at this and it's a low, it's a low score. It's an average of one, uh, but it is a great opportunity to build awareness of not just the steps that the city is taking now and planning to take, but also um, I think resources that are available to customers to, you know, empower their own decisions about their water use and do a, do an audit or some troubleshooting on an irrigation and get some help from the city. Um, so I'm not going to uh, spend too much time here, but want to jump to the first of the four key questions that we asked. Um, and we did share these summary scores with you guys in the little read ahead of this meeting. Um, but the first piece, and this comes right back, Mark, to your, your question. So thinking about those existing water waste regulations, the even odd day, the hours of irrigation, um, you know, our, our interest here was, do you think that continuing to focus on education or shifting to enforcement is the better better part of the spectrum for the city to be at. And uh, here, uh, the average score was four. So leaning towards that, um, you know, ramping up enforcement side uh, was the response from the committee members for the survey. So just wanted to pause and just kind of check in around the room. Does anybody want to, you know, chime in or, or provide some insights on how you responded to this question, reflect on kind of the group, um, the group score here? And if not, we've got some questions for you. Go ahead, Tess. Thanks. Yeah, I just I think it's a little bit interesting that everybody on who took the survey kind of coalesced around the idea that nobody really knows about the WaterWise program and yet enforcement is the first place to go rather than education. So I was wondering, and, and excuse me, I did miss some of your past presentation. So please let me know if you already covered this and I can do some more reading myself. But are, are you able to give a quick synopsis of what education you have tried to do around the program thus far and whether there's any room to grow in that direction before the enforcement aspect, sure. given that we think that few people know about it. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll probably lean to uh, somebody from the city staff. I can, I can answer as like the third party of the observer. Um, and we did in, um, I think the second meeting, we shared a couple of annual reports that are from parts of this program that talk about how that's actually shifting a bit because the city is layering on you know, more data available. So now we can try different things within the program. Um, and Mike, please, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. We did cover that in some degree in some of the earlier presentations, but we didn't go into a, a great level of detail, I think year by year to talk about some of the uh, educational approaches that we've put out, um, you know, designed to increase the level of awareness, right? Um, obviously, we have some work to do there. So, you know, the short answer, I think, is yes, we have a lot of opportunity there. Um, and I think that, you know, that piece of information, you know, was one of the First things I was, yeah, I guess, uh, pleasantly surprised to see it was just you know clarity on our eyes of okay, we do need to ramp up the level of education and understanding that these programs are do exist, right? Um, and so, no, we absolutely have some work to do in that area. 
Thanks. I mean, certainly sanctions will will bring people's attention to the program, but I just thank you for the clarification. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Tess. And Mark? Well, I'm wondering, and maybe Tess is also for you and, and sort of the group in general, when we say that people aren't necessarily aware of the WaterWise program, I'm assuming that might be the comprehensive and focused program versus the regulations. I think most people who uh, irrigate know that there are certain times and days that they're allowed to irrigate. And, uh, you know, may, maybe there are some of the more nuanced requirements around waste and leakage that, again, you would expect, especially given the backflow requirements and the like, that it's probably something that's required. So I, you know, may, maybe we should also, on, on that note, test think about the committee. Do we think people just don't even know that there are requirements they should be meeting, or is it that we don't know that there's a formal program called WaterWise? Because I'm guessing it's more the other. I'm guessing people are aware there are these regulations. And so that would make it a little bit more um, you know, sort of acceptable to start enforcing those regulations sooner. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. That's a helpful reframing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if I this is Dan Denny, just to just to comment on that and kind of reiterate what you guys are saying. I think you know the larger awareness of the WaterWise program. Uh, a lot of the interaction and education we have with customers is the one-on-one -on -one or targeted interaction. We do have you know seasonal messaging and and media outlets that we do use, uh, but you know what we found is um, you know we are hyper-focused on that, that customer uh, interaction. And so like to Mike's point, I think, you know, as a, a larger program branding, maybe we could do a better job of, of getting the word out of the all encompassing offerings of the WaterWise program, I think. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Neil, you had some thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, um not fully knowing the suite of tools that could be evaluated in all of these different areas, I think is a little bit of a challenge. And I know that, um, you know, just hearing some of the ways that the program so far has been effective, has been using meter data to do direct outreach to consumers. Um, you know, in my mind, that kind of that kind of approach is somewhere in between education and enforcement, right? Telling somebody they're doing something wrong is a form of enforcement, even if it's not a, I don't know, it's a slap on the wrist, not a fine. Um, and so I, you know, I don't think that, um, I think that a lot of the interventions, you know, can kind of lie in the middle and sometimes enforcement is used as an education tool um, or something that's considered education is, is really a form of enforcement too. So I think, I think I'm open to a lot, um, but, uh, you know, those more direct engagements are, are more of where I was focused here. Um, Neil, let me give you a quick example that I think will help the entire group. And that is, as Dan Denning, our program manager was alluding to, we run algorithms on our water use data. So when we say a data-driven program, we can spend a lot of money trying to reach everybody and their brother. And that's expensive and a lot of that the bottom of your inbox gets deleted, doesn't get read in your water bills and so forth and so on. But what we have done is we, we are targeting those 10% of the users that are using way more than their water budget based on all of our data would show. And I think it's been super effective and I think it's really well received in building trust with our customers. So that's one avenue, but I, I think general awareness, new customers are showing up every day. We've created a new customer brochure that talks about where their water comes from, where it goes at the other end, all the services we provide. So we're going to continue to refine those things in the future. What we need some more you know, development on is how much of that $10 million that we'd like to spend on conservation over the next 20 years is going to be the most impactful for the bottom line. And that's where the data, the analysis, and the public acceptance mix comes into play. And it's a big soup. And there's a lot of levers there on, you know, turning the temperature up and down on various things that we want to do. But love your feedback on that. And you guys are asking all the right questions. So thank you. Peter, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> uh, to Patrick's point, uh, it's not, we, in being in the building industry locally for quite a while, we benefited from that when, um, we had clients whose water lines were hit and no one would have known because you couldn't see 
anything above ground. And uh, actually the city got to us first before bills came out or anything and said, Hey, something's not right. And it was a, it was fantastic. Um, save the day. So that's just a side note. My thought on the um, education and enforcement, like it, I really think it's common sense that we need a little bit of both. Um, and an interesting stat I try to keep in mind as our community evolves is, you know, we have about, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12,000 new residents every year going back for the last four or five years. So even if we had a robust education program that was rolled out, whatever it is, five, three years ago, we have continually having an influx of folks that were either um, casually, you know, organically educating about new things or whether it's city official programs, um, everything from the fire free, you know, you speak to new people who arrive and they had no idea that exists. Um, so the, the education piece, we can't, it's a, not mutually exclusive. I think we need to keep up on both, you know, how to use roundabouts, how to save water, what the rules are for irrigating, but it's an ongoing process because the sheer numbers are, are massive. If we, if we think about the new, um, new, you know, residents here. And if we don't have any enforcement, then everyone kind of laughs it off, like whatever, no one's going to care. So a mix of both, but maybe a little bit more on the enforcement side than we're seeing currently. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of how I tried to answer the questions. I don't want to give up on education. That's by far the first piece. And, but once people are educated enough with the excuses, <laughs> All right, that's a good segue to Bill. <laughs> well, I, I think it's always a challenge on education to keep things in the front of mind for people. Uh, having tried to get conservation programs out there, I, I think we were always struggling to get people to be aware of all the, we were giving money away. And it's like, I mean, not really giving it away, but we had incentives and it was hard to do that it was hard to get people to participate and it, it took a lot of work and so i think education is always in a place where we can do better and think about new ways and new uh targets for the information i i i know you all must do uh, a lot of education with the irrigation contractors but they seem like a a, a logical place to focus some education and the, the general populace, I think, doesn't think about things like conservation very much uh, until, until it's time to either buy something or change something or something breaks or someone tells them about it, they hear about it. And that's kind of where I, 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 I was voting for stronger enforcement as well. And I, at first I thought, well, you've got the, you've got your uh, nice AMI system. And, and it sounds like Patrick was mentioning, you know, you could theoretically get a hold of people when you see they're not irrigating, they're either irrigating too much or during the wrong times. Uh, you could, and it sounds like it might be a little expensive, but, and how, and I guess the other question I have is how much of enforcement is going toward that 10% that are going way over their water budgets. That, that would seem like a logical place to start. And you know, maybe the warnings are okay in the beginning, but if nothing changes, that's, you know, you're gonna use the old Pareto principle, get the ones, get the ones where you can get the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, I, anyway, I've, so I think irrigate, I don't think we should get I don't think we should cut back at all on education. I think it's that you always got to do it and maybe ramp up, but this is almost add the enforcement to it over, add more education and start adding enforcement, mixing it into it. I, I was another thing I just thought about. So I, I was, I'm a volunteer as a wilderness ranger, you know, the Deschutes national forest did the, the thing last summer with the, the permits. And that was about education. We had the same discussion, education versus enforcement. If people believe that nothing was going to happen to them, then they're just going to keep doing exactly what they always did. So it was a mix, education and enforcement. Yeah, Bill, good, good 
good observations and uh, we couldn't agree with you more on your, your in let me just give you two bits of information to help the group. Number one, the conservation education and enforcement are only two levers. And, and the other big lever that a lot of people commented on was how do we get to rate structure at the right time? And water budget rates. And if you guys all want a really good read, uh, look at some of the past materials that I sent you on water budget rates in the future. And really what that does is level the playing field and drive people to become efficient through price signals and also reward them if they're under their water budgets. And that's the most real way to drive people and change the, uh, the industry to provide services that the customers are demanding. So it's a full loop, it's a full business cycle connection there. What we can do is provide the data to say, you're in the ballpark, you're not in the ballpark. And those water budgets have to start as that educational tool that's real. So your, your water bill has to be a key part of that. And we're gonna talk about that more in separate issues coming up, but you guys are not missing anything. Again, that was really outside of our discussion bill, but those are all connected and you have to keep coming back to what individuals and businesses are using for their particular need. Are they being the most efficient and what metrics are you using to determine that? And then, you know, you start, you start hitting the water wasters or the water, not just because they're using a lot of water, but because they're using it inefficiently. That's really the sweet spot in the equity and, and that kind of piece. It's really delicate and it's nuanced and it's gonna take more data integration and we're not quite there yet with our utility billing and software systems, but man, we're a lot closer than we were when I started in 2000. And I think we're trending in the right direction on that as well. So I, I see that coming, Bill, uh, real quick. And Mark, same th same thing for your questions. You know, that enforcement has to be documented well. Uh, leak detection that you mentioned, Peter, that has been amazing. When we see somebody whose meter is not going to zero, that's a really, really good good tool we've been using uh, and saving tons of water that way for just leaky stuff. So. Mark, we're, we're coming back to you. Uh, do you feel like the, the group has chimed in on that question? That yeah, yeah, and um, also if, if we're spending too long on this, if we need to move on, I, I can save it for later. Are we doing okay on, on time? Was it meant to be a conversation like this or are we slowing you down too much? This is the, the purpose of our time here today. Um, okay. But at some point, Neil's probably gonna give us a nod to speed up, so <laughs> go, yeah. go ahead. Well, on, on this issue of education versus enforcement that everyone's raising, I'm curious if you have any past or even anecdotal information on how effective just those warnings are that people just need to be uh, notified and if that has shown that it changed behavior. And then in that uh, sort of a two-part question, uh, if you've got lessons on that, even from other things like sidewalk, uh, snow clearing and, and the like for the city, other places where the city is needed to go out there and, and nudge people in the right direction. And then I, I think this probably gets to Patrick some of what you're talking about, sort of the, the cost of doing something where it's in the rate or it's low enough of a penalty that it's just sort of a, a cost of doing business or you look at it as an actual expense versus it actually is a penalty that's supposed to generate deterrence and change behavior. And um, you know, I, I think there, and then there's sort of the mix of when it's a signal, like sort of a little enough to, to let you know, hey, you shouldn't be doing this, like paying the five or 10 cents on your um, grocery bag at the grocery store if you don't bring yours. It's not that you can't afford that, it's that it lets you know you should probably bring your own bag um, versus places where you can have sort of, uh, sort of unintended consequences of pricing uh, an activity and then letting people feel like the cost is low enough, it's something they're willing to pay for. There's a, a famous study with a, a daycare where parents were coming later and later to pick up their kids. And so they added like a $5 charge if you were late. And then more parents started showing up late because like, oh, it's only five bucks, I can pay for it. It's a transaction, it's okay. So I, I know there you all deal with these issues, but sort of that balance of voluntary information versus trying to change behavior and what you've learned from your experience on that. I think Dan is going to respond and I'm going to advance to the next slide, which has a couple of other follow-up questions just so people can digest that while we keep talking here. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I can speak to that just a little bit, Mark. And uh, it really depends on the customer, right? Um, you know, some respond to just, you know, um, the, the initial notice of, hey, I didn't know I was in violation. Some are more interested, you know, respond better to the economic driver, of, you know, uh, an incentive or, or a fine. Um, but just a little bit about the process, you know, when we get a, a report or a violation, 
um, and we open up a case for water waste, that opens up and starts a civil case uh, so that we need to document and follow up on and inspect and, and follow up with reinspections until it, you know, it gets to that point that we can either deal with it through education and, and working with the customer, um, offering help resources um, that they can take care of it themselves and kind of like a DIY, like self-resolution type scenario or pointing them toward a contractor. Um, we've never, we've avoided uh, getting to the fine strictly because, uh, you know, it's $450 a day. And economically speaking, if they can't afford to hire a contractor to come fix it, that $450 a day isn't going to help them get it done any quicker. And so the piece we're missing here or that, you know, we haven't had in the past was that, uh, that incentive help them get over that economic hurdle of, well, okay, here's the issue. Here's what we need to do to resolve it. And by the way, we've got this suite of rebates that you can now take advantage of to help with that. Um, to Bill's point, we do direct a lot of our education in the winter uh, through workshops and continued education opportunities for contractors, because we know those are the guys that are out there touching the controllers and, and making these adjustments. Um, but they're not going to do it if there's not, um, not a market to get paid for it, right? Um, you know, we've seen some add uh, irrigation um, maintenance or water wise packages, they call them to their, their maintenance packages. Uh, but really, we've got to build that market for them. So what the, the angle we've taken is driving the customer demand. So working with the customer to drive the demand to get the contractor to do it, right? Because they'll do anything that the customer or we ask them to do. They just need to get paid for it. Um, so, yes, uh, for instance, uh, just real quick to get back to your, your point, Mark. Uh, last year, we had 95, I think, resolved water waste cases. So that means a case was reported, it was opened, we followed through, um, and they were resolved. So the issue was resolved uh, by the end of the season. Um, so I think it's effective, um, but there are also those cases where I would love to go slap a fine on. <laughs> just, you, you, you get to that area where, you, you know, that, that area where you're pulling your hair out and you're just like, this is the person I would like to find. Uh, we just haven't got there yet. Um, and one of those main reasons is we still have city sites that violate code and we need to set the example. And so we're working internally through our large landscape program with our streets and our transportation and mobility department now to kind of rectify some of that, but we've still got a ways to go. So, um, multiple things going on here, but we are looking towards that. Thanks, a lot of useful information, appreciate that. Councilor Campbell. Thank you so much. If you don't mind if I ask, um, I'm thinking about contractors who install irrigation systems. Do we have any way to make sure that those systems are programmed for the right days and times when those contractors leave the site? Sorry. Yeah, we don't have a, a system of checks and balances for that right now for an install, but we do have, uh, to allude back to the WaterSmart software, we are able to see when people are not adhering to that schedule. And those are people that we proactively reach out to. So we'll send um, messaging during the growing season, sometimes on a weekly, sometimes on a monthly basis to those customers to let them know. Real quick follow-up. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Do we... Yes. And do we um, attempt to educate those contractors that this is what we expect from them, that when they leave the site, the system will be programmed for the right days and times. And then, you know, if the owner reprograms, then we catch that by the system you just described. Yes. And, and so a lot of the contractors, you know, just because we deal with that green industry so much, a lot of them appreciate them, uh, us notifying them instead of the customer oh. uh, and getting them in trouble. So we give the opportunity for them to go rectify it first. Okay. Um, it's not always the case. It doesn't always work like that, but that's the way we try to do it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great. Great. Patrick. This is Patrick. I, a great question. And I want you to know, and, and, 
share with anybody else you're talking to at council or, or anybody else, because I know you talk to a lot of folks. It's really important to understand this is a statewide and national issue related to the irrigation dis industry. And, and we've been working at the national scale to develop these standards. And that's what we want to bring down. And so those little, you know, at the yard level pieces. And let me give you a couple of examples to give you some comfort. We have tried to work at the state level to change legislation, and we did. We were very successful in the early 2000s. You were a licensed landscaper in 2000. You did not have to have continuing education for your to maintain your license. And when I saw that as a municipal water provider, I went through the roof. I said, you have got to be kidding me. The technology alone is changing rapidly, and these licensed landscapers aren't keeping up. And so we went and proposed legislation as a statewide municipal water group and got that seat requirement added to that licensure. We got the first municipal people, and I was the first one that went to the landscape contractors board and got on that board as a public member. So you have to go far and wide to influence the, the national and state and, uh, and other regional areas to do that. And we've been wildly successful, but you have to keep at it. It's just a continuing uh, issue of ongoing legislative policy and, and these kind of groups we're doing right now. So it takes a lot of time, but in the end, it's, it's a framework that just gets better and better as you, as you go in time. So great question. And um, I don't know how many more slides you have, Aubrey, but we have about 25 minutes left or a little bit more than halfway through if you want to judge that with what you have left. Thank you, Neil. Um, I was just going to check in. So maybe uh, put these questions in your pocket, these follow-up questions. We're going to dive in because the next section really gets into the new code standards and there's, um, you know, a, a piece of that puzzle that we want to get your input on for sure. So let me go ahead. I'm going to share, uh, walk through a sequence of three slides and then pause. Um, so we asked the same question for both indoor and outdoor. Uh, where do you think Ben should fall on the spectrum of voluntary at the side, one side of the spectrum, all mandatory um, at the seven side of the spectrum in terms of new indoor water efficiency codes and standards, so things that aren't part of the program right now that could be in the future, things like a, a toilet standard, for instance, when it comes to indoor, do you think, you know, all voluntary or all mandatory? Um, and average score here for indoor was five. So again, leaning into that all mandatory uh, conversation. And I'm gonna um, advance. So similar score for outdoor uh, in terms of what the, the committee's advice was, uh, but a little more aggressive. So, so a six on outdoor water efficiency. And I think many people commented on how that's responding to um, that seasonal graph that, that Patrick shared at the, the start of our, our conversation today. The third slide here, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, we also asked you guys about pace and just to kind of group these responses, we gave you a few different scenarios. Um, you know, only after a period of more education and training uh, should, um, sorry, the question is, if new codes and standards are mandatory, how quickly should we get there? Uh, and so, you know, many of you said some version of not necessarily slow, but um, a thoughtful pace or a measured pace, uh, ranging from, you know, using a period of education and training to, to launch into that or slowly phased in over time or only after a period of incentives and rebates. Um, and then we had one suggestion, let's, let's just get to it. You know, let's go as soon as possible. So wanted to frame this up and then again, you know, pause and just kind of um, check in around the room as you guys think about this and think about the, the scores for indoor and outdoor, uh, the suggestions about timing, um, see what reflections folks have or uh, other comments. Because this is pretty interesting. There's a, there's a target out there of all mandatory, but, um, you know, advice, and this is kind of comforting because it feels like, uh, you know, we, we can take it at a measured pace. Um, any thoughts on any thoughts on this? And if not, I'll skip to the next one and we'll ask you some direct questions. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I don't think it's one or the other here. I, I mean, it, yes, you you are going to have to have more education, and I think I think they can happen at the same time I mean, you can be moving to mandatory uh, mandatory codes and requirements and you're going to be educating that you're going to do that and you can come up with the incentives and rebates to meet those requirements uh, while you're putting it together as well I, I don't think you can just go 
like, okay, everything's mandatory now. Uh, good luck, right? I think you would get a lot of pushback. And, and, and I think it's fair to give people the education of, that is, is going to be mandatory. But I think you can start working on those standards while you're doing, while you're, while you're educating and coming up with the incentives and rebates. I never think it's free riders to do incentives after something is mandatory because it, you got to, it, it helps you, you. There's a reason that you're going to make it mandatory and it's going to save the city and people money by giving them rebates to meet the mandatory requirements. So I, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, uh, has to be done in quite so sequential a way to make it work. You got to know that you're going to have mandated stuff coming up. I mean, you have to know that. Keeping that goal in mind, but maybe a hybrid package yeah. of some of these other elements. Yeah. Great. And, and Covey. So I think for me, um, kind of the, the making it mandatory or just um, kind of the penalty for it. Um, I, I do think it, for me, it makes more sense to enforce that for repeat offenders um, and still having a system where, you know, having some kind of warning and education at the start, but if, then if there's like flagrant um, violations that are occurring repeatedly, especially, I think that's when it makes sense to um, make sure enforcement is an option as well. Um, and I don't know if this is the best time to bring it up, but I also do, just want to bring up kind of the issue of equity as well. I think it was brought up in some ways um, by some of the previous commenters, but um, I just want to make sure it's not as, as, you know, based on some, some of what I heard, uh, it's not a, the enforcement doesn't become something that just is, has a, a impact that's inequitable for people who are not able to easily make fixes um, are the first to be punished. Back, yeah, you know, I largely just want to echo a lot of what Covey, Bill, and I think before them, um, Peter said that I think we can do both. I think we can ramp up education and enforcement at the same time. We don't have to do one first to wait for the other. I, when I was thinking about it in the survey, I thought of it as like a three strikes you're out sort of policy, right? Like use those first two strikes for education, letting them know that, okay, uh, third strike, here comes the enforcement mechanism or maybe it's not instances of a violation, maybe it's a time period. So you have two months to rectify this problem. We're gonna educate you on uh, why it's a problem and what you can do to rectify it. And if you don't do that by the end of the two months, here comes the enforcement mechanism. Go ahead, Bill. I just wanna make sure we're not uh, maybe confusing standards and codes with enforcement. I mean, it, there's a, I think it's a slightly different it's a slightly different approach. I mean, the codes and standards are say, okay, you can't buy anything but a, you know, a one and a half gallon shower head, or you can't buy anything except drip irrigation when you put it in. Uh, I, that, that's a little different than saying you're, uh, you're violating our, the, the ordinances on irrigation. That, that's a little different. So I just want to make sure we aren't mixing the two up here a little bit because standard and codes are, they're, they're kind of at installation time or at, at replacement. So you just can't, you know, can't go to Home Depot and get something that's really crappy and put it in. I, mean, I guess you could, but you have, then you have to work with the big box stores and the suppliers to only stock the stuff that meets the requirements. Anyway, I, I just wanted to make that little distinction. Yeah, appreciate that. Mike, you have a follow-up? You know, just a quick follow-up to, uh, to Kavi's comments about equity. And I know that came through the survey um, in, a, in a few different forms and a few different contexts. And I do want to assure the committee that we're going to be working closely with Anna Allen, um, the city's new uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion director, um, to really get an understanding of how we want to look through that lens. Um, uh, I was actually just in a meeting, our leadership team meeting this morning with Eric King and Anna and, and a lot of our uh, other, other department directors and just talking about how we're going to be looking through that lens um, more in the future, whether it's uh, through a uh, rate structure process, um, a cost of service analysis, uh, conservation programming, 
Um, we'll be looking through that lens quite a bit in the future, um, but uh, super excited to have her here to have her help guide us through that process. Councilor Campbell. I had another question. I hope it'll be a quick one. Um, it, are we looking into SDC charges as a part of this WaterWise discussion? Councillor, I can respond to that. Uh, great question. Um, no, that one, that question, that, that will be outside of the scope of this, this exercise here. Um, okay. You know, system development charges and really how that influences long-term water efficiency, you know, and really demand management is something that will be uh, a part of that analysis when we dive into it. Okay. I believe we're going to be looking at water, sewer, storm, um, and, um, and transportation uh, collectively here at the same time with a working group over the next year. But, uh, but yeah, that's outside the scope of this one, but good question. Definitely related. Thank you. So I'm gonna um, skip over to a couple of other follow-up questions that we had um, related to this, this same section. So the, the first two, um, we've, we've touched on this a little bit already. You know, if, if there's this period before, as we're leaning into, you know, potential mandatory new codes and standards like the toilet standard uh, kind of concepts, um, folks had said after a period of education and training and just wanted to open it up if, if people had, you know, an, an idea in mind of something that would be an effective education and training program. Um, also related to this set of, of uh, feedback, we wanted to, you know, we asked these questions without any time scale associated with them intentionally, uh, just to get your, your initial thoughts. But um, if, if any of you want to chime in on what, what time scale you had in mind, I mean, it could have been 20 years, 10 years, five years, you know, one year, six months, and that all is much different in terms of how quick you go to mandatory. So uh, two pieces and just want to open up the floor if anybody wants to comment on either of those before we dig into the third question here. Mark. Well, I guess I'll say that maybe a full season seems like a reasonable time to give a 12 month process that that seems like a, a pretty reasonable from my perspective. I don't want to speak for anyone else. Thank you. Anybody else on the on the time front? What you had in mind? Go ahead. I just had a quick clarification question. So when we we're talking about mandatory codes, and I appreciated um, Bill's kind of clarification of that we're talking about codes, not the enforcement right now. Um, a code is, to me, just mandatory, right? A voluntary code is like a recommendation. Um, do we have any voluntary codes right now or recommendations? See, Mike is thinking about it. Yeah, I know. I was just, yeah, that was my, that was my confused look. Uh, kind of a great question. Um, not that come off the top of my head, um, you know, the, the nature of codes and standards is that they're not voluntary, um, that they're pretty prescriptive. Um, but, but Patrick, anything come to mind from your side? I, I know some of them may be treated uh, voluntary, and I think that's part of the problem um, in some cases. But uh, anything else to add, Patrick? Yeah, I think Kavi, you've hit the nail on the head. So let me give you some examples. Over the last 20 years, we've had some buzzwords come through the landscape industry like zero scape. What does that mean? Is it zero scape or is it zero scape, right? And there's a whole plethora of things you can do that are kind of voluntary. And those that are uh, you know, motivated and interested and activated will do that. They'll put in uh, a pollinator garden or they'll take out their grass or they'll do something, but that's voluntary right now. And that's driven from a bunch of different areas. It's not required. Uh, no grass in town, though we have said, hey, we don't want any overhead irrigation sprinklers along the right of way in certain areas. And so that precludes the use of grass because you really can't irrigate it very well without overhead sprinklers. You know, and I'm talking about the sprays and things like that. So there are a, a ton of those things out there, but we don't really think about them in those terms. Now, one of the things where we're discovering as we go through our code books, both our engineering specification standards, our Ben code related to development code and landscape requirements, tree requirements, things like that. There's some vague general recommendations. Do some water-wise stuff, but it doesn't really tell you how to do it or what to do it or it's very prescriptive. So I think the way I think about it, Kavi, it's a continuum. You're over on the left you're not thinking about this stuff and then you want to move further over to the other side of that continuum what 
concrete actions can you take that will guarantee some savings over time and better management and more efficiency per square foot per person, whatever the metric is. So it, it's a mix of things, but that's really what we're going to dive into in the technical group is what are those things that are going to bear the most fruit, the least expensive investment right now in terms of both education, actual parts, uh, inspection time, you know, enforcement time, those kinds of things. And so how do you reduce the gallons per minute on one zone firing in your yard? How do we bring it to be less wasteful that water is not going past the root zone or blown into the street? And there's ways to do that with new technology and we can specify that as a requirement. So that's just a little bit of a taste of it, but there's so many areas there between irrigation technical, between the controller, and then really what you do on the ground with your plant choices. So those are kind of the sweet three, three mixes of areas that we're looking at on the outdoor side. Indoor engineering specs, you know, from shower heads to toilets, those kinds of things are a little easier and more prescriptive with national standards as well, as well as the water-wise standards. So we have some, some pretty good check boxes on that, that to bring to this group coming up here next year. Um, and I mean, I'm assuming that answers your question. Um, and I'm going to go to, to Peter and then we're going to skip into the last little uh, segment that we had here on the, the work group advice. So go ahead. Just to, I don't know, maybe add some context for Kavi's question. In the residential construction world, the code cycle is roughly about three years. And then each time there's a reach code, which is a voluntary program um, for builders to choose to do it. But it says, how um, how the authority says you reach this reach code kind of lays it out and what that gives is for the next code cycle it's usually an indicator of where the code is going so builders who choose to be proactive figured out those who don't choose to be proactive kind of know like this is coming and this is how we need to gear up um, so the only con the equivalency I can make of a voluntary code is this reach code for residential construction. Thanks, Peter, for bringing that experience. Uh, that's helpful. Good. So the third question on here, sorry, I almost, I almost skipped to a uh, work group without, without diving into this. This is just, you know, an opportunity, you know, we, we set it Kind of a bar of let's let's look at enforcement uh, in terms of existing water regulations, even odd days. Make sure people know about that, that they're practicing that. Um, through the survey feedback, we're setting a bar of you know let's look at some mandatory options for these new indoor codes. Um, let's look at some mandatory options for new outdoor codes. If you thinking about all three of those things together, uh, not separately, as we ask them of you in the survey, is there one of these places that you would advise staff to prioritize? And, and Kavi, I know your, your hand is up and let me know if uh, that's, oh, there we go. Okay, Bill, go ahead. <laughs> Which is the biggest issue? That's, I mean, that, is it summer irrigation? Are, are we facing a demand issue and versus production? And it doesn't sound like that, but it seems like the biggest spikes are in the outdoor water use. So it, it seems like you would want to be addressing, using the, using the tools and policies to address the places where that you get the most effectiveness out of. And if it's outdoor water use, then focus on that. And if you, people are violating or using more than their water budget for outside, then focus on existing regulations that are associated with that. Uh, indoors look like in your winter usage, uh, it's, it's a fairly manageable amount. I don't think we should, I don't think the city should ignore it because like it's equipment based, right? For indoor, for the most part. And that seems fairly straightforward. But which which of the answer? I guess I am throwing the question back. Which which places that you need to address water use the most? And I'm, so I, I guess I won't answer the question. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of the 
the conversation, but I, I do want to tell you what I've learned over 20 years hanging out with some super smart engineers that have modeled our system. And where are the biggest costs coming, Bill, for the future? And this is really about the biggest incremental cost we have in our capital construction is to meet those peak demands. And where that shows up are in two main places. If I can't get water across the river because I have a constrained pipe size that now has a velocity that's super high and unsafe, then I need to put a whole new pipe in. That means digging up the street, on and on and on. Very costly, very disruptive, all kinds of issues related to that. Again, when you stop and you say, oh, then I have to put a larger reservoir in place because that peak day demand creates a certain amount of gallons moving uh, around the system to meet fire flow still, then I have to increase all my reservoirs too. So yes, I think the largest opportunity for significant capital reduction and at least delay, if not elimination is in the peak summer. But again, all of those pieces are, are part of the puzzle. And so if we all put 1.28 gallon flush toilets and made that mandatory over the next five years, that would have a significant benefit in the summer as well as the winter because it brings all the lines down, right? So you have to do all of it, but, but Bill, you're right. I think exactly. we're focusing on the outdoor and the peak day, and that's why we have the even and odd days. That's why we have the no watering between nine and five. We know when our peak hour demands are, we know when our peak day demands are, and we're trying to spread that demand out while still meeting that, that uh, beautification aspect of landscape and all the benefits it brings to Bend as well. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Um, any other comments, I guess, on, on any aspect of these new codes and standards before we jump into the, the work group advice or other reflections? All right. So the um, kind of the, oh, I saw a hand flash. I'm not sure who that was. <laughs> um, the, the last key question. Um, oh, well, I don't know if you were looking for it in terms of prioritization across those. I guess just, just throwing out my vote. I could see how where we've got existing requirements and regulations, something where we are warning people that we're going to get more serious about it and then start to get more serious about it. it feels like one of the easiest places to make progress. You know, you don't have to do a lot of additional work and start to send the signal that the city is serious about this. That 450 a day, that sounds recognizably unrealistic, but I can imagine if I saw an extra $10 on my bill one month because you had detected that I was watering on the wrong day or during the day, I would I wouldn't complain about it. I'd almost expect that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to be more careful. I'm going to go program things differently. Um, I realize there are equity issues there, but that would sort of be my vote is um, set a path for at least enforcing a little bit more what we already have on the books. Thank you for that. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so our last kind of key question that we asked you guys was advice for perspectives to involve in this technical work group moving forward. Um, and we're starting to dip into those waters kind of in these follow-up questions too. You know, it's the, it's the scenario strategies for rolling these things out. How could they actually work together? Uh, work group, we wanna do a little te teaser of that right now. Um, Patrick's gonna share that and then we'll um, talk a little bit about the perspectives you guys suggested involving. So Patrick. Yeah, thanks. So. So right now, you know, think of it, as I mentioned earlier, we are talking about code alignment. We want to dig into that. We have some work to do internally with our CDD, you know, community development group. We have our plumbing inspectors and building inspectors. We have our private development folks. We need to get our internal team together and make sure the things that we would like to propose in code changes are actually doable, enforceable, and manageable for everybody's workload right now in a pandemic and and all the related issues of the fastest growing city and county in the, in the West. And so we're gonna dive into those and have some proposals of code language to bring to that technical group. But really we're looking at updating and aligning those three areas, the water waste regulations. And Mark, I think it's really uh, great. You know, What are the ones that are on the books now versus what do we wanna add any? Are there any that would be efficient to add and, and helpful or just my by how we're enforcing it today, using more technology or automatic notifications, those kinds of things. Uh, and then propose and consider updates to the indoor codes. You know, does the city of Bend wanna be the first city in the state to, to say, you know what, our toilet standard is above the federal standard. We wanna adopt the 1.28 gallon flush for residential. Not a lot of impact there, because that's about all you can buy now. 
but that was sending a big signal and a big message there that, you know, that we're being leaders on that. We want to install those. They flush better, they work better, and they are going to continue to uh, improve our water use on the indoor side. Things like that. And then lastly, the, the, the trickier one is the outdoor irrigation codes and standards for all the reasons you guys uh, talked about today. There's a lot of little pieces where you start. If you look at, hey, if you're going to put a pop-up irrigation head out there, it has to be low flow. It has to be less than 0.6 gallons per minute. 1.8 gallon per minute, typical Rainbird 1800 that's installed all around the city right now that puts out more water than the grass can absorb. So all kinds of areas to chip around the edges to start you know, off on that path to better standards. And we have to learn internally how to... How to you know, install them, how to then inspect for them, check them off the list, and then pass a house or a development that these are the specs that you put in, work with those landscape contractors. So that's what we're going to bring to this group. Uh, we're looking at around eight to 10 members. Uh, it wants to be fairly technical folks that understand this language. So we don't have to, we don't want to train landscape landscapers in this process. We want those that understand the impacts for their businesses as well as their management uh, costs and make that bearable over time. And then the implementation strategies is really key. And you guys touched upon a lot of that today, but we'll get down into the weeds a little bit about all the things that you talked about. How long would we want that education? Do we want to use the building code standard model for a three-year rotation of, we'll propose the new standard, it'll be voluntary for three years, we'll have education incentives during that three years, and then it becomes mandatory you know, in year three or what have you, whatever schedule makes the most sense. There may be some that we want to ramp up faster. There may be some that take longer uh, and are more costly. And so we can look at all those and, and keep rebooting it as we do our water management conservation plan updates and our programmatic updates. That's what we're looking at today. And then how do we then target those incentives so they're timely? Uh, one of the things that we will look at is maybe some of these areas are really ripe for pilot programs where we take a small subset. We launch the program, see how well it's accepted, see if we can manage it with, with the tools that we have with our utility billing team, with our staffing that we have, and make sure we don't overwhelm anybody. If it doesn't work, well, we don't keep going. We try something differently and keep adaptive, adaptively managing those programs as we're coming out. So that's where we're headed towards next year. We probably are going to be towards the latter half of next year, just based on the internal work and education that we have to do with our own staff various departments that we work with. So we, as much as we have to educate these committee members like yourselves, we have to educate our internal staff that aren't familiar with these details as well. So a lot of folks to in, internally educate and then get in the same direction on this as well and, and understand what their priorities and needs are. Uh, the city with a lot of priorities and, and limited resources. So there'll be some trade-offs and some good discussions I'm sure coming up. So um, just real quick, these are, uh, in terms of what we heard from you guys as to which perspectives would be most important to involve in that technical work group and conversation, um, we've given you some, some options to rank. And uh, definitely three of those are kind of rising to the top as the vital perspectives, the landscape and irrigation contractors, large water users, and also an interest in ECC representation in that process. So I'm uh, glad to hear that. We didn't exhaust you yet. Um, the timing on this too, you know, the irrigation uh, contractors, of course, have a, a season of work. And so that's probably going to fit into when this kicks off as well, just acknowledging their time commitments. You guys also gave us some advice on other perspectives that might be um, interesting to engage in this process, uh, ranging from you know, equity, homeowner groups, uh, multifamily residential representation, you know, some specialist perspectives, water resources, economist, engineer, behaviorist, thinking about how do we make change happen, um, and youth. And so uh, I think, uh, Mike, you also had some ideas here, reflections from, from the cities after having heard some of this feedback. Yeah, I was really uh, encouraged. For, uh, we work with a lot of these folks. So I think in my mind, it meant that we're already working with a lot of these groups and have some, some well-established relationships and I think have some technical people out there uh, within these buckets that we can pull in um, to, to uh, take a seat on that uh, conservation and tech, uh, technical efficiency conservation and efficiency technical work group. Um, no, I, I think, you know, question to the group, you know, are we missing anybody here? You know, maybe a, a question to Dan Denning as well, uh, conservation program manager, Dan, I mean, do you see any key parties missing here, groups that you regularly um, connect with to talk about these issues? 
but the open question to Dan and then maybe the rest of the group, are we missing anybody? Anybody else come to mind? Yeah, uh, just real quick. I think we've got a majority of the folks covered here and the majority of the spectrum we need. Um, I might, uh, we work with OSU extension a lot. Um, oh, yeah. That might be a good person to bring in, uh, possibly Amy Joe, as well as uh, maybe a landscape architect that works on some of our public right-of-way projects, somebody familiar with our existing standards and specs uh, that can help us kind of navigate that process as well. Yeah, I didn't think about the landscape architects. We do seem to do more and more work with them and walk them through some of the projects, 14th Street, uh, Newport Avenue, um, some of the more complicated landscapes that have gone in here recently. Um, so Aubrey, I guess open question to the, to the committee here. You know, who else? Anybody else come to mind that interests that need to be represented um, as we dive into the weeds and talk a little bit more about sprinklers and spacing and flow rates and those kind of things? Again. Okay. Good. So no, no hands raised there. So there's probably some follow up on that uh, third line of ECC involvement. Um, figure out what that might might uh, look like and who's really interested. Um, we did want to talk just next steps. So our task um, is to take all the all the great conversation today and and. Oh, you always want more time for this. Um, take the survey feedback, the conversation today, package that up into a summary memo. Um, that meeting on the 16th is a chance for that subgroup to help us uh, review and finalize that memo. And then again, you know, moving forward into 2022. Um, what is the memo going to look like? Pretty simple structure here, you know, a background, what's the purpose of the document, a section on committee advice, what we heard from you guys thinking about two pieces there, both these four key questions that we've asked you along the way um, and really capturing um, kind of the, the themes, the, you know, the goal targets that you guys have set and some of the nuances that uh, justified your responses. Um, and then if there's some other themes here in our, in our dialogue, uh, you know, the, the equity affordability, some things that might not be fodder for that technical work group, but other things that you guys would like the city to consider, um, the Waterwise program team to consider moving forward. So that's what we're gonna try and capture keep it short and sweet, um, thoughtful, but succinct, you know, maybe three to five pages here in terms of that section. And of course, we're also going to include documentation of how we got here. Um, not anything that you guys would need to review because you've been part of it, but you know, our slides and our uh, meeting materials and everything else will be part of this package so that that is uh, all in one spot as we move forward. And then a quick summary uh, at the end. So pretty straightforward content. And if there's any, I guess, any other questions or, or notes, I want to say thank you guys for uh, feedback and time. Yeah, let's turn it over to Mike to close us out. I'm not seeing any hands. So, oh, Bill, I'll do a quick question. Will, will, you, will you send out uh, the draft or the copy of the memo ahead of the 16th meeting? Will that be, will there be enough time to prepare that before? Thank, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, yes, that's our intent uh, is to, Okay, um, great. Give you guys a, a chance ahead of that meeting to take a look at the document. And again, trying to, you know, focus on that advice section uh, into your feedback so it's not daunting. Um, and then we'll, our goal is to walk out of that Thursday meeting having it be, you know, this is the final. Uh, you know, we just need to make these changes if we're good to go. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, really appreciate you uh, putting the slides together here and really walking us through kind of the next steps. Um, as we get through the 16th and have that summary document and have a, a final draft that, uh, that fully, I think, captures uh, this process and what we've heard today, the next step for us is to update our city council um, on the steps that we've taken here. We're currently on the schedule for a January 5th work session. Um, I think that's going to be up for, for some discussion. And so I'm not super concerned about the timing. I will keep this group uh, updated as to when that occurs. But I do know we have other multiple uh, water related conversations um, heading our council's way. And we may uh, package those together. Uh, uh, could be on January 19th, although there's a budget coming to them then. So uh, if this gets into February, uh, please don't be alarmed, folks. Just uh, lots going on and lots of jockeying for position on council uh, uh, agendas. So I'll stop there and maybe answer a couple of questions. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, curiosity question, since we know the experts here, how much is the city of Bend's like water supply dependent on the annual snowpack? Oh, 
Patrick, I'm going to let you uh, take a swing at that one. That's a great question, though, Peter. The lack of snowpack. There's a lot of ways to answer that, Peter. And, you know, whether it's glacier, whether it's snowpack. Um, I also read some comments, Peter, that people put in their answers that maybe I can address here kind of a packaged answer. Number one, 65% of our answers comes from surface water out of Tumalo Creek, Bridge Creek system. Uh, I will just tell you that any water that we let by during the irrigation season doesn't stay in stream. It gets picked up by Tumalo Irrigation District. There, there's some complexities in water law there, but I will tell you that most of our water supply then is really groundwater, just minutes before we pick it up as surface water. And so the second piece of that, the other percentage of our peaking is from wells that's down deep in the aquifer. Uh, groundwater is not a painless or risk-free option either. It's expensive to pump. It's, a, it, it's uh, carbon footprint is high. And I will tell you, as somebody that's been watching this trend for many, many years, we are an unconfined aquifer, though it is well protected mostly due to its depth, it is not risk-free from contamination. So there's no silver bullet. There's no simple answer that, hey, we need to put more water back in stream and use groundwater. That's a better option. It's not. It's a trade-off for each. And so as we head into the climate world and the climate change and reductions, what happens, Peter, the simple answer is, we can take recharge for our groundwater-based surface water system through rain or snow. Uh, snow acts as a little bit more of a reservoir, and so it can release it a little bit slower or fast, depending on the weather. In the last five to 10 years, it's come off much more rapidly. And I think the experts are predicting uh, a faster spring ramp off and runoff. And so the good news is if we get more precipitation or less, it still contributes in our recharge area and the cascades to our supply, whether it's surface water or groundwater. So again, short answer is we don't need snowpack. We're actually planning beyond mid-level elevation snowpack and taking that precipitation as rain still recharges the aquifer, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Easy question to close us out. Peter, that was a, that was a good one. So uh, thank you. Uh, all right, Aubrey, I think we are uh, uh, wrapped up here. So Neil, we will turn it back to you. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and thanks uh, to the committee for all of your involvement in this process. Um, and we'll wrap that up with the, that, that subcommittee afterwards. Um, so it looks like Serena is um, here and she's going to give a little bit of an overview about the election um, for the ECC chair and vice chair expectations and all that. Hello. Um, first thing, Mickey, I don't know if you put into the slide deck that spreadsheet I had. And if not, that's totally fine. Um, Let's see here. Hi, Serena. I did put it on a slide, so let me open it up. Perfect. Thank you. Um, it, yeah. it was a pretty rough draft, but Neil and I kind of went through and talked through current state. Because um, we wanted, before, you know, we wanted people, we really wanted people to kind of understand the current state of the workload that Neil and I have been doing. And obviously this might change down the road, depending on priorities and, and how things um, move along. Uh, so we obviously have this meeting um, every month and there's a pre-meeting plan that we usually meet with Cassie or Mickey or other staff as required. Um, we make that one 30 minutes and that's usually a week before the agenda is due. Um, as it's a publicly noticed meeting, the agenda usually has to go out um, almost a week before the meeting. Uh, so we usually try to meet before that and just talk through and make sure that everything is set in stone. We've talked to the people that need to be part of the conversation. We have documentation and, and information um, as needed appropriately. And then we have the committee meeting, which again is two hours long. I say prep time in that is, um, you know, that's obviously dependent because we've kind of done some prep work already. Uh, but this might be, uh, again, that's just kind of estimated. I usually try to make sure that I have in my, uh, <laughs> my kind of thoughts together and different things and make sure that everything's in order on my end for anything that I'm covering. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we thought that prep time for that would be. Um, 
And then we have a post meeting session that's usually a day or two after this meeting. And that lasts an hour. We talk through, you know, everything that took place, any uh, follow up we need to do from the committee mem for the committee members, as well as any guests or uh, other topics that arose that we need to reach out and talk through. Um, and so that prep time, again, I say prep time or just time that it takes beyond the meeting itself is, you know, that can take anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 or more. Uh, if, you know, Neil and I are doing outreach for a specific topic or different things, I could take more time. Sometimes it's just remembering to do a couple emails and some follow-up and making sure that things are set uh, before the next meeting or for whatever timeline we've set. And again, um, some of us are moving into small group sessions. So this is very much a low-level estimate. But, you know, again, kind of working through meeting times and prep times for that, um, I just put kind of a general uh, average, of, you know, with the home energy score topic, we met for an hour. Um, there wasn't a ton of prep time other than creating an agenda and just making sure that we had things in place. So, um, but on average, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure we weren't over embellishing the time frame, but also making sure that you guys understood the commitment overall. Anyway, so um, it's estimating to be around five to six hours a month. And as I noted here, both Neil and I, we try to share the role as much as possible to make the workload and, and everything else as equal as we can, um, knowing that, uh, you know, uh, we're trying to just be fair and, and sharing, the, sharing the workload. Um, and that might change too, depending on, you know, who's, who's in charge of the next session, but. Any questions on that um, on that overall chart before I move forward? I don't see any hands raised. Any any thoughts on um, on anything else around this before I talk through next steps? Okay. Um, so with that, we do have uh, in, our, in our guidance that we will select a new chair and vice chair in the January um, meeting for the following year. So that's kind of our, that's one of our main focuses for January. Um, that'll be on the agenda. One of the things that we didn't detail out because we had a lot that we were trying to define in our early stage um, group process is how to actually go through that process, right? How to do the vetting for chair and vice chair and what that process should look like. Um, Neil and I talked about it for a little bit, but we really want to make sure that you guys have a say in this as well and how you feel that we should um, move forward with that kind of um, transition, potential transition of roles and how uh, any opinions on how you think we should go about that, um, that process. So I'm opening the floor for questions or comments or thoughts on how you feel you want to do that. Because again, it wasn't specifically defined in our process. And if we like how that works, we could potentially adopt that going forward for future, um, in our future uh, committee documentation. It's open-ended. <laughs> Bill? Okay, I'm going to think out loud here, so bear with me. So it was a little awkward the last time. Uh, we didn't really set up a process, but it seems like pretty straightforward. You want to find, I guess, solicit any interest in those positions prior to January. And then it seems like we would have nominations for each of them. Mm -hmm. And then vote independently for each, for the chair and the vice chair. Uh, and that seems fairly straightforward. And if there are more than one candidate for each one, I mean, you can do the old rank choice thing, but why get complicated for this mm -hmm. small committee? Right, right. You know, I just, again, yeah. wanted to make sure, because we do know it was a little uh, cumbersome the last time to kind of move something forward. So um, it shouldn't be a hard, complicated process at no. all. But exactly. I also, you know, everyone has their own opinion on how they feel. And, it, you know, it can be, it's more about the logistics of 
you know, do we open it up here and ask people if they want to be part of it? Or do we do it after the meeting and people put in, you know, their position in a paragraph of why they feel they want to be a specific role? Um, and then we post it out to the, you know, to the group that way. Um, you know, there, there's just some small logistical ways that we can kind of make the process um, work. So every personality and character has an opportunity to share how they feel, you know, they want to be heard. Rory? Yeah, Serena, your, your idea there of um, someone letting us all know in advance and writing up a short paragraph, I, I think I like that because otherwise you're left with this like at the meeting instant decision, mm -hmm. um, which it is fine in some ways, but it, it can be good to let us all dwell on it. But, you know, the other concern is I don't think we need to formalize over over formalize this. Right. Like I wouldn't want to put a big burden of like campaigning <laughs> <laughs> on someone, but it, it could be fair to like a month in advance. Let the committee know you're interested. Right. Like, you know, maximum of 200 words as to why you're interested, mm -hmm. just so we can go into it a little more informed when we vote on it. I like that idea. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, not to preclude others who might be interested, but it doesn't feel like you've actually had the positions that long. And I don't know if, um, if, if you've had thoughts on that. You know, it might ease things up if uh, you know, we know if you're both interested in continuing your positions, because it, it does feel like you, you're sort of just getting it figured out, I'm sure, and bringing other people up to speed unless there's someone really anxious for it unless you're sure you want to be able to take a break from it. Right. No, that's, that's a fair question. Um, and Neil and I have talked about it, but not officially uh, talked through it. Um, Covey, did you have a question? It was actually Mark asked the question. I was going to just ask if it was fair to ask if the current <laughs> chair and co-chair were going to be running again. So yeah. it gives more information um, and clarity. No, I, it's a good question, obviously. Um, I'm definitely open to the position, but I also want to make sure that if anyone feels really strongly in kind of taking this role that, you know, that they're able to have that opportunity to do so. That's, that's my personal um, thoughts on it. I'm happy to continue it, but I also am very much okay stepping aside if somebody else wants to, um, you know, jump in and move forward. Bill? I, I, I'll join the chorus because I had the same thoughts about it's really we didn't get going until we, we kind of did we were chairless we were we were rudderless <laughs> for a while and yeah. you guys have just finally really gotten up to speed i think and I, so uh, if you're both interested i i i, I hope you are I, and and if others are interested that'd be great too i'm gonna go to kelly and then i'll let neil uh speak his piece on his position as well <laughs> it, it seems um that regardless of whether it's new leadership or, or existing, just following the process of submitting your name in with a paragraph to allow for just kind of in, entire open flexibility. Yep. Yeah. I would agree with that. Thank you. Neil, do you have any? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that it's, I think the process like Kelly mentioned is really good. I know other groups, um, there are there's always apprehension about putting your name in the ring if you know somebody else is also putting their name in the ring and they end up these really complicated and awkward like well why don't you do this and i'll do this and then you like completely avoid all process so um i like the idea of you know including ourselves um writing up you know what we're what we're interested in doing um and i and i think that that I want to make sure that whatever process we do have leaves open the opportunity for um, for a leadership in this group to adapt and change over time, yeah. um, because I think that it's really easy to um, just kind of get stuck in um, uh, with with somebody will, that's willing, um, you know, having kind of an outsized influence over many years of a committee. So yeah. um, I'm I love the idea that's been proposed. Um, and generally speaking, I think my, uh, interest as well of wanting to see, you know, lots of ideas through this committee, um, but also I'm still willing to participate, um, and happy to participate to kind of move off of some of the momentum from, from this year. So still planning on doing that. Thank you. 
Um, so I guess we didn't formalize this. Uh, do we, does everyone feel comfortable with that process of submitting um, your, your name and a short paragraph on why you feel you'd wanna take a certain position? Um, we would we'd send that email to Mickey and uh, then she would compile them all. Ideally, we would want to probably list something within the next week or so. So we have a couple weeks to kind of think through who's who's all um, looking to to be part of that position. And then um, we would do a formal vote in January after everyone feels comfortable with with that information that's shared. And we can, um, in our recap, we can kind of detail out that process specifically, just a little bit more than what I just said today, um, just so everyone has better instruction. But the general idea is that you would submit your name and uh, comment via email, and then um, we, would, we would share that to the group for everyone to deliberate, and then we would have a formal vote. Covey? I was just going to add to that um, as part of that paragraph, I think it would be helpful uh, for anyone who is interested in running to um, kind of to what you presented, Serena, just be able to detail that they have the time capacity to be able to take that on. So just making sure that there's that's covered for, I guess, everyone who's running. That's a very good point. Thank you. That you're willing to submit. <laughs> and Serena, just to clarify, it's fine for you all to submit interest, but you'd be deliberating at the next meeting, yes. not outside of the meeting or amongst yourselves, right? You'd all just get it and individually think about it and then deliberate at the meeting. Yes, thank you for clarifying, Mary. I know <laughs> yeah, I know you know <laughs> that, but I'm just <laughs> clarifying in case no, anybody I'm, listening doesn't know that. that. I am glad you're here because <laughs> it's very much, um, I depend on that. Yes, yeah. I appreciate that. And that, that's exactly <laughs> Bill, or do you have another question or? Yeah, yeah. So, so those will be submitted to the chair, who can then distribute them. Correct. Yeah. So Did you want to have we'll, them before um, in in the agenda or whatever. Yeah, Neil and I okay. will um, formalize that specific process uh, in our recap tomorrow, our post meeting tomorrow, and then uh, Mickey will make sure that everyone has the the directions on how to go through that process. And uh, just another quick question: It is a What's the term in this case? Because we started, it seemed like in October or we started in November, one of those two. Is it, is it, is it going to be, is it a calendar year because of the way this got started or is it, so it would be, you, your, you all's term would end at the end of December. Is that, and then they would take over in January or what, what's the, what's the term? Yeah. I, I, yeah, the code says that every permanent board commissioner committee shall elect a chair and vice chair annually at the first meeting in each calendar year. It can be a little okay. awkward when you start midway through the year. And, and it doesn't say Which that it can't be the same chair and vice chair. It just means, as they're pointing out, if somebody else wants a chance, the group should decide um, okay. how to do, you're doing the, exactly what you should be doing right now. Cool. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you everyone for your feedback and um, more details on that specifically will come out um, in an email after tomorrow. So I'm going to hand it back to Neil. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to give an opportunity for the, um, the CFEC Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Rulemaking Advisory Committee um, uh, that just the the engagement that Rory and um, Percy had in kind of they were asked to to look into this and, and report back. So, um, Rory, do you want to take this on? Yeah, sure. Um, so Kersey's not here today, so unfortunately, I am the subgroup. Um, <laughs> but I will give you all a quick update. Kersey and I did um, spend a little time looking into this rulemaking, and we met to kind of talk about it. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, we don't have much time, but I'm, I'll give a super high level overview of these rules to everyone and then sort of share this draft letter that we put together um, that I don't think we're looking on any like vote or decision on on uh, whether we want to like sign that as a committee today. It's just a draft and maybe formal action on that could be next meeting. Um, so uh, this rulemaking, the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Rulemaking, um, 
it's, it's being undertaken by the department, the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, which is the state's um, like land use agency um, that set, uh, creates rules for land use and transportation planning. Um, and they're doing that rulemaking because of the governor's executive order from a year, year and a half ago, which directed multiple state agencies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, across the state. Um, so the staff at DLCD has put together this huge suite of new rules to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through transportation and land use. Um, and just a little context, the transportation sector is now the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. So it, it's a lot of details, a lot of different new rules that um, are being proposed. Very high level overview of just kind of like the core um, areas of these new rules. Uh, it will require um, metropolitan areas in the state, including Bend, to designate what they're calling climate friendly areas. Um, so think of like uh, higher density mixed uses, um, neighborhoods in cities that uh, re reliance on the automobile is greatly reduced. Um, so higher density and uh, uh, re requirements to prioritize alternative transportation modes. Um, so building different types of transportation in those areas. Um, there's also uh, proposed new rules on parking, um, kind of both in the, so on the electric vehicle charging side, requiring that infrastructure and new developments of a certain size, and then also um, requiring cities to either remove or significantly amend their minimum parking standards. So how many parking spaces we require new development to build. Um, also requiring cities to um, kind of change how we measure the performance of our transportation system. So historically, we've, we've looked at vehicle throughput, like how well is this transportation system getting cars through it, um, which has led a lot of um, cities to build, build new roads, which of course just creates more driving. So this would kind of change that paradigm and ask cities to measure their transportation systems based on other metrics like safety and use of alternative modes. Um, so kind of a big shift in the more technical side of how this planning work is done. Um, and then I kind of already talked about this, but it would also require cities to prioritize alternative modes and kind of how we spend money on transportation projects. So there's a ton of details in that. That's my very high level overview. Um, Shifting to the draft letter that we sent out just a few days ago, so um, I, you know, don't expect folks to have taken too much time with it. But I'll just go through like what Kersey and I were thinking. Um, first of all, we we just so this letter is to the rulemaking advisory committee that DLCD is is doing this rulemaking through. Um, it informs them that uh, we are the environment and climate committee. Here's our charge: is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, pursuant to the Climate Action Plan. Um, it lays out the transportation-related actions in the CCAP. And then there's just a little kind of general support language for these rules, because as far as Kersey and I can tell, these new rules would, um, uh, they're in sync with these uh, transportation-related actions in our Climate Action Plan. So we don't, our thought was to not get too far into the weeds with this letter. Um, just because there's so many weeds in this rulemaking, but just to give this general vote of support from the Environment and Climate Committee that we see this rulemaking as in line with the work we're already doing through the CCAP. That's kind of my update. Um, Mary, uh, I know you emailed me and Kersey uh, during this meeting like an hour ago, offering again to meet with you and other city staff to maybe think a little more about this letter. Um, I think we'd be happy to do that and maybe make some edits to this draft letter to bring back to the committee in next month's meeting. I think I would just Ooh. say, because we've got our own letters going to the city, which are not inconsistent with what you are saying, but we want city positions since you're a city committee to have some of the same themes and I would say one of the biggest themes coming from not just Ben, but really all cities have to do with the um, timelines in the rules. Like, and actually some of our long range planning staff brought up with the staff of DLCD that 
some of the work of the ECC would be set aside if these rules go in on the timelines they've anticipated. It is so, and some of it is simply unworkable um, because of the kind of planning amendments, the staff it would draw from everywhere else in the city to do things that we've already planned under council goals, that the timelines, that I don't think they've completely thought through and, and they admitted that. Um, the way this is set up structurally. So I think we kind of just want the theme of, we like a lot of these actions, but we really need you to listen to cities about like the TSP that we just adopted and the bonding and the bike ped projects that are going forward under that. We, we do not want to stop the good work we're doing because a whole new set of rules is putting planning requirements for which we have no staff, no FTEs, no process in place to do it that pivots us away from all the work, like everything you're talking about, all the codes you've talked about doing, they'd be off the table if these were adopted tomorrow as drafted. So that's kind of our big picture, like setting aside the nuances and the weeds, which I could get into on some of it, but that's kind of our main theme is just making sure, and I think all the cities are saying this, is, is, is we need more flexibility with timing. But we could talk, I mean, Brian Rankin and Damien could talk more about the specific timing issues. I think I just would like you to hear from them because they run those staff and those programs and have really looked a lot into um, a Gantt chart and how it would connect up with all the other work that we're doing. Neil, I don't know quite how we want to go forward from here, but I I'll hand it to you to figure that out since we're at the end of our time. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I guess my follow-up, Mary, would be, you know, if we're wanting a unified response, I would be curious to see how we can involve the ECC more in that process so we can actually have a unified perspective on this. Because um, right now, if, um, you know, with, Cassie's absence and the ECC not being a part of those conversations, then it's not a unified perspective around, you know, the balance of climate um, and, and implementability. So um, I, I don't know if there's opportunities for that to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, in the without Cassie being here, I think probably the best thing that I can do is, is try to set up a meeting with a few key players at the city. I mean, we've got a pretty big team working on it. Like, you know, our equity director is looking at it from the equity perspective of transportation. We've got, you know, seven or eight people, but the key are probably the long range planning and, and a couple of us from legal that could meet with you and just kind of give you the big picture perspective and I was at the meeting with DLCD staff and I was at one with Jim Rue. So we've got some, we could, you know, in a better setting when I'm not taking up all your time could kind of relay to you um, the right level for you to engage in. Cause I think what you're saying is similar to what council has said as well. You know, in, in the big picture, we're very supportive of these rules, um, but we do want them to work for Ben and we don't want to, take away from the other things that we're doing that are consistent with our environment and climate goals. Most importantly, that's what we don't want to do. Right. Um, well, I think um, process wise for this meeting, since we are um, just about at time, um, I see that Bill's uh, um, hand is still raised so we can see if he has a quick comment um, but then otherwise I guess that follow-up and then Rory you can send out whatever lessons you've learned to we'll, we'll include that before the next meeting so then if there's a recommended action we can discuss that and actually um, you know take that action as a committee the next um, at the next meeting sounds good build Bill, did you you had yeah, a hand raised I, before I, I did, but yeah, I did. I do have a hand. I'm just, so I'm just. I'm sorry. Excuse me for not quite understanding. Um, I'm just a little puzzled. So is this 
what, what's, what's coming from the committee and what's coming from the city and what's, I, I, maybe we can go into that more in detail next time after you guys get together and reconcile it. But is this, who's signing this? Is this coming from the ECC? Is this coming from the council? Is this coming from the city? I, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled. The, the conversation that ensued after Rory discussed it, I, I'm, made me a little confused, sorry. So our idea based on last meeting was that this would come from ECC, from this committee, okay. uh, based on our, our work implementing the CCAP. Um, I, you know, Mary's uh, thoughts about trying to align with other um, conversations going, I, that's a new element to me, um, which, you know, happy to take on um, and, and, and work um, on that prior to our next meeting. Okay, yeah, because I think the points that Mary raised are good ones. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Neil, if I can just add a quick point on that. Yeah. Um, was just to say to Mary's point, it sounds like there's these decision, um, the, this meetings that are already happening with a group of people. And I wonder if, if it makes more sense to maybe have someone from the ECC be a point person as part of that decision-making process and, and see that that could be a way to not have two parallel kind of letters going out, if that makes more sense. Yeah, I think the first, I think what I will try to do is set up a meeting with this subcommittee and and bring in David and Brian. The, the that that's a good thought and that would be the most efficient. A lot of the discussion comes at this big meeting that a lot of city staff are at and it's just one agenda item. So I'm just I'm hesitating because I'm thinking how would that be scheduled to meet your schedules? Um, but it's possible that you're right. That would be most efficient. Um, and then all the right people would be in the room. But let, let me get a quicker meeting like soon um, before then, like before everybody starts leaving for the holidays. And I'll try to, I'll get my um, assistant to try to get something on our calendars in the next couple weeks. Does that work? That works for yeah, me. Yeah, sounds good. Can Counselor to you too. Yeah. Okay, I will do that. Counselor Campbell. Um, I would be interested in participating in that subgroup if that's, um, Mary thinks that's all right and if the committee thinks that's okay. And I have to go, I have another meeting. <laughs> and thank you all so much. Thanks, just your work is tremendous and we really appreciate you. So I'm gonna log off and you all and Mary can decide whether or not I would be of any help or use at that subgroup. I myself am trying to educate myself about this new executive order. And yeah, I think about our code right now where we have two separate cottage codes because we were working on cottages years ago. And then the city or the state came in with House Bill 2001 and said, you have to have a cottage code. So, you know, it's to me, that's kind of the analogy for we have such good work underway. We don't want to get slowed down on that because they're requiring us to basically do the same thing that we're already working on. But either way, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. I can see Mary's going, Barb, don't influence the committee. I'm sorry, I'm not influencing you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Um, all right, well, we are... Um... We're over time as per usual, um, and we didn't get to agenda setting as per usual. Um, so if people need to log off or want to make a comment about agenda setting, um, please feel free. Um, this is our plan for the next meeting. Um, we have a spot here for reach code, um, but the reach code committee hasn't met yet um, um, because we haven't really had much to update on. There's, there's barely some draft uh, information. So we will um, kind of before the next meeting decide if we actually need that space and if not might be able to um, give up some of that space and we'll also hopefully have Kathy back in January. Um, yeah, Bill. 
Yeah, quick question. So we the work plan had some stuff around uh, loans and it had some stuff around home energy reports and it seemed like they were in this time frame. So what's yeah. um, what's so going on with those? The, the um, I um, we can do an update at the next meeting more completely um, that kind of explains all of that. But the um, uh, really briefly, we um, they had the timeline had one of the two starting early for Reach Code or um, the revolving loan fund, um, and the anticipation of the legislative session pushed the Reach Code up further. Uh, or push the reach code up first, but we'll go through some more of that kind of work planning stuff um, in the next meeting. All righty. Um, if you have anything burning, uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Otherwise, um, we'll call, uh, uh, we'll adjourn this meeting. <laughs>